Tiger Woods admired Navy SEALs so much that he'd spend time away from golf training with them. Both elite soldiers and professional athletes are in pursuit of greater strength, endurance, increased cognition, and improved performance under stress. What can the advances in how we maximize the potential of soldiers teach us about performance in athletes? Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Andrew Herr. He is a certified mad scientist by the US Army and has spent the majority of his career obsessing over how to make teams of soldiers, mainly Navy SEALs and athletes, faster, smarter, and better. In other words, he was tasked with creating super soldiers. He is now the CEO of Fount, where he delivers comprehensive, customized performance health solutions. In this episode, we look at the health tools and protocols that many athletes might be overlooking in their preparation, the importance of timing and individual customization of nutrition, and what drugs and approaches are pushing the cutting edge and the possible gray areas of sport performance. Andrew Herr, welcome to the Exponential Athlete Podcast. Ken, it's great to be here. Uh, I always love our conversations, so really looking forward to sharing a bunch of knowledge today. I, I love our conversations as well. I mean, obviously, you know, as, as we've talked offline, as I've gotten to know you more, you are by far one of the most knowledgeable people in my circle or maybe in any circle on the planet in terms of human performance, especially as it relates to the military in creating soldiers that are stronger, have more endurance, that are more resilient to stress and these types of things. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about how that could apply to athletes or other elite performers that are civilians. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think what I was really privileged to do in working with military and certain types of special operators was to see what happens to a human when they're at the very edge of what's possible for them or for any human maybe whatsoever. To see what uh, happens when they're not sleeping for one night, two nights, when their bodies are put through extreme stressors like altitude or now you're scuba diving, you're underwater, pressure changes, to see what happens when you know, you're deployed for three, six, nine, 12 months at a time and, and have to handle stress in and not just individually, but now as a team and in groups. So all those factors, I think, um, to me, apply not only in the military environment, um, but to sports and then also to companies as well. Heck, I, we have some of the um, insights from there. We even take into like people's marriages. <laughs> That's incredible. Well, I, I want to highlight something you just said there, which is that these uh, you know, soldiers, they're effectively in these hyper-stressful conditions, they're losing sleep, they're traveling around a lot. That's very similar to what we see professional athletes doing. If you're a professional tennis player, you're traveling all around the world, you're dealing with different time changes, you're also dealing with stressful and physically demanding conditions that most people are not. I immediately saw the immediate corollary between these elite military performers and athletes. So I would be really interested in your perspective on like, what are the foundations of athlete performance, maybe from a physiological side, from a psychological side, as well as a um, like internal like stress or um, or like st how stress relates to a physiological side? Yeah, so I think we can think about it kind of top down or bottom up. So when I type top down, I'm thinking like psychology down. Um, and there's no such thing as just psychology because your psychology influences your physiology. Uh, and so what does that mean? So we're thinking about um, the psychosocial aspects of stress. How are you processing stress, um, your levels of anxiety, things like that, that are making changes in your physiology also? And how are those potentially uh, affected not only by yourself, but by your teammates, by your coaches, um, and, and the sort of social milieu around you? Heck, even by your relationships you're in outside of sports. And then there's the bottom up, which is, you know, the three primary systems that influence performance day to day are your metabolism, including also like muscles and things like that. Second would be your stress hormone system. And the third would be inflammation. And so how do we manage all three of those systems? And that gets into everything from what you eat to sleep. Um, and all these other factor travel that each of those can dysregulate or re-regulate those systems in a way that allows somebody to perform at their top and recover faster. If there is a, a phenotype or sort of an outcome that defines elite people, it's their ability to reach an incredibly high peak 
and then recover relatively fast compared to other people. And after that recovery, not kind of dip below their baseline, but kind of recover back to baseline and then be able to do it again and again. That is one of the things that defines elite special operators and elite athletes too. If you're getting injured all the time, you're never gonna be the best of the best. And so an elite athlete isn't just skill, it's also endurance, not an endurance of your body too. So as we talk about those three systems, Obviously, a lot of your work is focused on hyper-customization to individuals, but is there maybe a broad strokes thing within those systems that you would see a lot of high-performance athletes in particular overlooking or not managing quite as well as the other interactions of the system? It, it seems to me that these are all very inter interconnected. All of our health is very interconnected, but usually, you know, some of us, particularly if we're in a specific high-stress scenario like professional sports, might be missing out on understanding completely. Yeah, I think there's a number of opportunities. So, um, and it probably varies by sport a little. I, you know, I have a little insight into some sports more than others, but you know, so let's take those three systems. The metabolic system, obviously athletes are working out a lot and they're training a lot. So in general, when I see their blood work, they're not like, you know, pre-diabetic, but you know, what we've seen now come out of areas like professional cycling is there are certain types of exercise that are counterintuitively important. So lower intensity zone two exercise, which has gotten really popular on sort of the metabolic longevity circuit is a relatively low intensity type of exercise. You're working out just at the level where it starts to get a little bit difficult to have a conversation. So you're not pushing yourself all out by any means. But that kind of gives you this metabolic base layer that allows you to run at, you know, not your peak, but move it at a very high intensity for long periods of time, which is important um, when you're not just sprinting during a game, for example. And so how can we take these types of training that have been uh, really identified in one sport and move them to another, in one area and move it to another? Um, and the second thing for and the metabolic stuff is, you know, recovery is going to be the global piece to all of this. Basically, when your body isn't recovering properly, you're dysregulating all three of those systems, metabolism, stress hormones, and inflammation. And so, you know, when you don't sleep, your blood sugar is more dysregulated the next day. Your body is not able to pull it into your muscles as well. It's not able to use it in your brain as well. You're just not going to perform as well when you don't sleep. Stress hormone-wise, um, I think... As people have gotten into training younger and younger, there's and and harder for longer periods of life, there's just an increased risk of burnout, basically. And so, how do we think about managing that? Thankfully, some of these ideas around meditation, breath work have started to permeate sport. Um, certainly, a fair amount of it in the military, and some interesting reasons there. Got, some of that came into the military, like you know, if you're a, a high performance diver and like Navy SEALs, there's some breath work stuff related to that, and so. Um, you know, some of the breathing stuff got into the military early through interesting routes, but I think, you know, the ability to, as I said, to re-regulate quickly, come back down to baseline quickly. So your body is recovering is really important. And I think stress management and management of stimulants like caffeine and nicotine also are probably a little bit underappreciated. You know, you might, maybe not you, you I know you work with pro athletes, but Many people might think that pro athletes are just doing everything right. They're eating all the right stuff. They're sleeping a ton. They're doing everything. like this is just not the case. There are some athletes who push it to the max and absolutely have whole teams around them. And then there are other athletes that just really don't care. And thankfully, they have elite physiology that can handle a lot of it. But if they want to push it to the next level, then taking care of these things really matters. And it matters both in earlier in their career, but especially to have a longer career. So I think there's some stress management, stimulant management approaches that would be helpful for people. Uh, and then on the inflammation side, outside of the top athletes, people are not eating that well. And many of them like to drink and other things, which is totally reasonable, but these things all together are influencing people's performance and recovery. And so that gets to this like bigger question is like, does somebody have to be a robot? No, they should have some fun. They should go out with their friends. They should celebrate with their family. But there is a trade-off there. And thinking about like what that trade-off looks like, what you're eating when you celebrate. You know, one of my favorite things to tell people is like, there is an optimal time to have ice cream. <laughs> there is an optimal time to have cake. Um, and so like, 
and there is an optimal time to drink and then there's an optimal way to manage the effects of alcohol bad food other things on your body and so one of the things we really like to do is like what is a protocol that i can use to mitigate the effects so that maybe you still shouldn't do this all the time but like if you're gonna drink i want you to be performing better the next day how do i manage the second and third order effects of alcohol and i think for probably most like normal people normal civilians normal non-professional athletes the hardest part about that is managing psychologically the oh if i do this i have to do this i have to do this probably even all the way up to professional athletes that can be overwhelming for a lot of people um how do you recommend because it seems like a lot of traditional things that we would think of sleep exercise meditation or or forms of what I would consider constructive rest or positive downtime are all effective. But how would you recommend building those into a protocol that is flexible, like you're saying, without having to like write down everything all the time? Yeah. So I think it, each person in this world has something they have a hard time saying no to, something they have a hard time controlling around. One person, it's sugar. Another person, it's alcohol. A third it's person, it's pizza for you, whatever it is. Like, uh, for a fourth person, it's working too much. Like, you know, it's, these are highly variable. So I think the first thing is, is to understand, like, what is the thing that seems to have a pull on you? Because, like, you know, some people have no trouble eating, uh, like, super healthily, no trouble working out, but, man, are they putting down a bunch of booze. And other people, it's a totally opposite thing. So I think understanding what's the thing you have a challenge around and then building more structure around that and not worrying as much about the other stuff um, is really helpful. Two, um, are there ways to make the right choice the easy choice? So, you know, one of the things we've tried to do, for example, we, we, we work with teams on jet lag and travel is like, we have an app that just tells you when to do stuff. Like you, you should not have to know, understand circadian physiology and the insights we've got in inflammation from Navy SEAL work to flying to all this. Like you, like, if you want to know it, I'd love to talk about that, but like, the average person should just be able to like get a ping from their phone that says like, please take the red pill now. Um, and so I think like trying to automate or turn, make as many things as easy as possible. Um, and then the other thing is just like making decisions at a time that's optimal for you. So if, um, if you know you get home from work and you're tired from the long day and it's been stressful, like that might be a really hard time to make a decision. But if you've already grocery shopped and the food in the house is all like pretty solid mainline healthy and there's like a rotisserie chicken in the fridge that you can just like grab some off of and it's going to be a good option, you've just made your life way easier. Um, and so it's, you know, just designing your life to make it easier um, to get whatever your goals are. And one of the things when we work with clients, like, people are like, oh, I guess I should want this. And I'm like, I don't care what you should want. I need to know what you actually want. Because if it's not tailored to what you care about, you're not going to do it. And if I give somebody the optimal program and they don't do it, it isn't like there's no benefit. So it's not the optimal program. So I think tailored, you need to tailor to your body, to your goals, and to your lifestyle. And when you do all three of those things, it's easier and it works better. So it kind of makes sense. I love that. I, I want to dive pretty aggressively into the individual personalized customization with blood work and all these things. But before that, I would love to get a little bit more information on how you first got interested in all of this to begin with. What people might not know is you're like a certified mad scientist <laughs> by the US Army. And they're, they're, to me, we're doing origin stories of all athletes. I'd love to get a little bit more background into like, why do you find this so fascinating? What, what What's in it that you just can't get enough of? So if I lived my life 10 times, I would have been a doctor, five of them. My dad's a doctor. My mom's side of the family is like military, 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 military. My grandfather was a no BS war hero, won everything short of the Medal of Honor in World War II. So that was really present. Both of those were. Um, and I found a program where I could go to Georgetown and do a degree in science, technology, and national security. And I was like, this is amazing. This is exactly like I could do both. Great idea. Um, so I was doing that work and was really interested in advanced technology and, and military and weapon stuff. And I was lucky enough to get a, a scholarship and then a fellowship from the government. They were like, hey, go to grad school. And I was like, if you're going to pay for it, I'm going to go straight there. I was interested in sort of nuclear weapon stuff. So I started doing a degree in health physics, which is radiation physics applied to human health and radiation protection because I wanted the nuclear weapon side of it. 
And I really found that the biology piece of it was really exciting. I worked in a nuclear weapons lab for a summer. I was like, isn't that interesting? And then I came back and I walked into the director of um, this immunology and microbiology program. I was like, I'd like to do your degree. He's like, it's literally classes start in four days. You had to apply like six months ago. I was like, great, I'm just going to start taking your classes. And if you let me in, then... Um, That'll be great. He's like, can you do that? And I was like, yes, I know the system here. So I ended up with three master's degrees, health physics, immunology, microbiology, and national security policy. And I got a call from the career center one day. Somebody, they're like, somebody walked in. They said they need someone who does biology, national security, and can write. And they're like, well, we know this guy, Andrew. And that started it all. I got hired to run studies on the future of human performance, human enhancement for the secretary of defense's like private think tank on future strategic matters. And that set me on this path of like a real fascination with how we can optimize our own people to have an advantage. You know, something that I know about you, and it now makes so much sense why you didn't go down the nuclear route, is that you love testing and experimentation. A little harder to test nuclear weapons. We haven't been testing them for a while. Things. A little harder. <laughs> I do love a good like data collection testing experiment. And thankfully, we're not testing them anymore. Precisely. Well, you know, to me, that that really flows very well. And it's obvious why you're doing what you're doing now. Um, you know, with Fount, you're creating these customized plans for people to optimize their performance, again, based on their blood work, based on uh, their protocols, their nutrition, all these things as they come together. Can you talk a little bit about the testing and the maybe the data collection side of that? And then we'll obviously go into how that could help individual athletes or people to improve their performance. Yeah, so I think there's sort of three data sets we like to start with. And the most important one will be a little counterintuitive to people. So I love blood work and any other adjunct deep physiology, depending on the person, could be genetics or other things. That's super helpful. I want to see the state of your physiology. The second is I want to see your day-to-day -day physiology in action. That's like, for example, wearable data. You know, tend to look at a lot of like whoop and aura data on sleep and HRV, heart rate variability and things like that. And then the third piece of data is I want to talk to you about your goals, habits, environment, family history, all those things. And what I said can be counterintuitive is the fact that that third data set, when, I'm, when I talk to somebody for 30 to 90 minutes, is by far the most valuable because I can intuit your physiology from what you tell me how your energy levels are at different parts of the day, how it relates to the timing of your meals when you eat and don't eat, how it relates to what you're taking and not taking, how it relates to um, your stress levels and other things. Like we can often intuit people's physiology from that. And we have a good sense of how accurate we are because then we're just gonna design and run experiments to test it and see what happens. And so we know what the most likely things are to work but nothing works for everyone. That's why it's like a true end of one experimentation. Um, my favorite example of this is like, we have found this supplement that in a third of people makes them sleep dramatically better, like 20% more deep sleep night one. Amazing. In a third of people, it does nothing. In a third of people, it makes their sleep worse. So in a traditional clinical trial that would show average outs, you zero effect. But I will tell you, that the people who it works for, it is a dramatic effect and it is not a placebo effect. And we know that from some rather funny um, like ways we do stuff where people try, one, we see people try 10 things that don't work and then five of them do, like probably not a placebo. And also then we've had specifically with this thing, some of our clients try to buy things when they we like run out because we have a very special source of this and they buy other things they think are the same and then they're like, it stopped working. And I'm like, yeah, it's not the same thing. So we get really interesting data. Um, but yeah, so I think I want three sets of data. I want to know questions like, imagine you know, uh, an X and a Y axis, a graph, where the Y axis is your energy level, the vertical axis, and the X axis, the horizontal, is from wake to sleep. Draw me the curve of your energy level. Draw me the curve of your stress levels, mood, focus. And then I'm gonna look at like what times you eat, what do you typically eat? And we're gonna put that all together and then we can start to generate very accurate understanding of what's likely going on. And then we use experiments to figure out exactly what's going on. Well, that information it seems is so much more rich. How do you measure, you can measure some aspects of stress in blood work and these types of things, 
but it's very difficult to measure energy levels. It's very difficult to level to measure focus, things along those lines. And those are the things that as humans, we probably care the most about. Yeah. And so the fact that you're able to collect, even if it's not perfect information, even if it, even though it's self-reported, to me, that is a huge differentiator in how we should be thinking about these things. Right? Those are the things that we want to evaluate for. If I feel like I have more energy, effectively, I do have more energy. I think it's very accurate to ask you how your energy levels are at any given time because the definition of energy levels is a subjective quantity. So I, I, I'm with you. I think you know whenever people ask what the things people want most are, there are 10 things people really want when they work with us. But like energy focus mood are the first three I'll rattle off because like that's a lot of what people want. And oh, by the way, your energy levels, if something makes your energy levels better for, and you do it consistently and your energy levels are consistently better for two weeks, it's almost always better for you and every other way. Yeah, There's obviously things you can do to like, you know, there's a lot of stimulants and other stuff that will make your energy levels better for a couple of days. But if you do it every day, then you crash. But two weeks, if something you do it every day for two weeks and you feel better almost every day, like that's a great sign that it's good for your physiology, your stress hormones, inflammation, whatever else is going on. That's one of my favorite kind of simple heuristics is like if I do this every day or most days, is it going to be good for me long term? So to me, it's a no brainer that elite performers should be collecting data on themselves, whether it's through a wearable, whether it's through blood work, whether it's through these things. What type of data are you potentially missing out on if you're not doing that on a regular basis? Again, there's some cost and accessibility perhaps for, for some segment of the population, but at the highest level, I know for a fact that a lot of professional athletes are not doing these types of things. What could they be incrementally gaining? So, um, for example, are they not noticing that certain habits are messing with their sleep? Because sleep obviously is the master recovery tool. And so then their physical and cognitive performance is going to be degraded. Their recovery could be degraded. So, you know, and it could be something that's not even that important. Like, sure, like maybe it's like, okay, great. When I drink, I don't sleep as well. Like we all kind of know that anyways. But like maybe they don't realize like, hey, if I ate a little bit earlier at night, I would do better. Or hey, nights I eat this thing, I don't sleep well. Um, you know, if I move my cold plunge from this time to this time, or if I do a sauna, I'm seeing these effects. So any of these things can drive changes that, here's the problem. If it's something's 50% better subjectively, you notice it. But if something's like 5%, 10% better, it might be hard to notice. But a wearable, if it consistently changes, that might be where it could really tell you. So I, where I like them is one, using them to either identify unexpected correlations I, or even better, two, to run experiments and see what changes things. And then three, uh, to notice patterns that are might not be obvious subjectively. Well, a, a common trend we see in every athlete I've studied is their willingness to experiment. But the thing is, it's usually within their sport in terms of their physiology, their training approach, a lot of those types of things. It's left to other their coaches or these types of people to help them experiment. Can you talk a little bit more about just your philosophy on experimentation? Like when is too much? When is the right amount? How much data do you need for it to be effective to understand if that's improving your health or hurting your health? Yeah, so my philosophy on experimentation is with almost everything we do is to min max things. So like I want to cause the minimum required effort to get the maximum benefits. And so how do we do that? Um, one, I'm never going to ask somebody to do too many things at a time because they'll just get like frazzled or get bothered. So I'm going to try to give you experiments that never have more than one experiment at a time. It's a big life change because like too many changes and people just stop doing them. Two, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give you an experiment in every cycle that has a very high probability of success. Why? We love seeing success. Our brains love dopamine loop feedback loops. So I want to show you um, that things are working. And ideally, I want to give you um, an experiment that's like super interesting to you every cycle. Um, because you're excited about it for whatever reason. You heard about it, your friends are doing it, you heard this guy on the other team's doing it, whatever makes something exciting to something to someone. So I'm gonna try to like not overload somebody. Um, I'm gonna try to give them kind of wins 
hopefully like things that seem more likely to be wins pretty commonly. And then I'm going to, but we're going to be running big rock experiments with every cycle too. Um, because, you know, obviously the, the bigger a win we can find, the bigger a change we can make, the better. So it's sort of this balance of like not overloading somebody. Like a lot of people, again, may think professional athletes are robots and they are not robots. They are people like the rest of us and they like enjoying life and as they should. Uh, if you have no enjoyment in life, it's probably going to cause you to burn out more. So I'm not trying to interfere with that too much, but I am trying to figure out, hey, you said you are you feel like if you had more endurance in the fourth quarter, that would be the next unlock for your game. Great. Here's the experiments where we can get to the goal you told me you care about. Amazing. And so can we do a little hypothetical? Sure, Let's yeah. say you have a professional basketball player coming to you. They have this pretty aggressive travel schedule during the season and they want you to help optimize their health, their sleep. Maybe their goal is to play uh, play at a higher level deeper into the season. How yep. would you approach that problem of a person coming in like that? Okay. So first thing we're going to do is are there any kind of outstanding issues or problems that we think are going to get in the way? And that's where I do want to get that baseline blood work, wearable data, see where we are there. Cool. Clean up any of that stuff. Some of it might be as simple as like, hey, like we see these like vitamin deficiencies that are like a vitamin B12 deficiency is the best thing you can ever find in somebody. Why? It's simple to fix. And they feel better fast, like amazing. Like, you know, we'll, we do custom, we make custom supplement packs for our uh, clients, athletes and non, and like, good, I just put an extra pill in there and it's like it's problem solved. Cool. Um, the second thing I wanna do then is look at the specific challenge. So you mentioned travel. Travel has challenges because it disrupts our schedule. Travel has challenges because it might, you know, when you're flying, might mess with sleep or other things. Um, but the third thing is we discovered that flying in particular causes an inflammatory response. Inflammation, when it's not like kind of happening at an inappropriate time, prevents um, the gains from exercise. So prevents you from getting more from your workouts. Two, it prevents your body from recovering as fast. It tends to decrease REM sleep level. So pretty bad across the board when it's not when it's you know affecting your body negatively. You know, we need inflammation because otherwise like a cold virus could kill you. But short of that, um, the good parts we need, we want to lower inflammation in general. And so we discovered that the pressure change in flight causes an inflammatory response, both because you're um, having this potentially this like weird effect where you have these little micro particles in your blood that can expand really quickly because there can be gas inside them. And then two, you're in a low oxygen environment in flight. The average airline, uh, in the average airliner, you're at like 8,000 feet relative altitude. So you're at the air pressure of about 8,000 feet. Um, in a 787 or an A350, you're at about 5,000 feet. But most people are flying in these flights at about 8,000 feet relative, and you're going to altitude very quickly. So what does that mean? That means we know from um, acute mountain sickness, like when people go to really high altitude, that going up quickly is the biggest problem. And we know from scuba diving that rapid decreases in pressure can cause this other microparticle driven inflammatory response. So probably the combination of both of these is clearly driving inflammation in people. Um, and so that's causing problems too, as one, the general recovery and other things. And then two, we now believe that the reason most people get sick when they travel is not because you're in a plane with other people. Like you go to the mall and you're around a lot of other people like in, in you might be in um, an airport. It's because actually the inflammation is distracting your immune system. So it's this combination of you're around a lot of other people, your immune system is distracted um, and, and the dry air and other stuff might be affecting your lungs, which, you know, or your respiratory tract where you get infections like colds and other things. So we believe this is actually the reason you get sick more when you travel. So. What are we going to do? We have protocols to help them mitigate that inflammation. We have a full supplement protocol for any kind of length of flight, short hop versus like, you know, we work with teams going to Europe and Asia also. And so we have these protocols that actually, based on the physiology, we know how to tamp down that inflammation, sort of stop it from starting and then tamp down what does start. And people report that they feel much better on travel. They're recovering faster. So what do I want to do? Timing isn't always just the compounds you use. I'm sorry, the customization isn't always just the compounds you use. 
Customization is also the timing of them. So it turns out that the compounds we use for this travel inflammation stuff are more similar person to person, but the timing is critical. You need to be taking it at specific times relative to travel. And then if there's a jet lag component, like if you're crossing multiple time zones, we're gonna use tools where we know how to push your, your circadian rhythm forward or backwards. Um, you know, obviously everyone's heard of melatonin, but there are specific B vitamins that can shift your circadian rhythm forwards. There are uh, ways to change the circadian rhythm in your gut and your liver, not just in your brain. And so we want to keep everything synced and aligned. And so for the super long distance travel, we've turned that into a product that we, you know, built for executives and now for pro athletes and a bunch of teams use it. Um, and then for teams, we do these custom protocols. Uh, either across the board or then we have very custom protocols for the individual, which is like, okay, we've found that this dosage can work for you of these different compounds. And so then on travel days, we want to add, hey, take this pack of supplements, um, you know, for this person might be 90 minutes before your flight, take this pack uh, mid-flight, and then the last one, hey, after you land, or if you land really late, we may shift that into the flight time or things like that. So from what I've heard in the in a lot of the research, they say it roughly takes about a day to get back an hour of, of, of time change, right? So if I go from California to Hawaii, it's three hour time difference, roughly takes me three days to, to match up. I would imagine we can't completely eliminate that, but how much can we reduce the, the lag that we feel over that period? We're basically eliminating it now at this point. We can send more than 90% of people to Europe or Asia. I'm talking 8, 10, 12-hour time changes and have them sleep well their first night. We figured out how to um, – it turns out that by tamping down that inflammation, that's one of the reasons you can't reset your circadian rhythm. So by tamping down the inflammation and then adding the tools to reset your peripheral like, and central circadian rhythm together – I mean, we just see wild effects. It's um, It's been one of the most kind of um, highest impact, most amazing things we do. Like there's nothing better than getting a message, a text or an email from like Tokyo being like, what did you do? I just slept eight hours my first night here. And they're like, well, that's kind of what we expect at this point. Does that involve exercise, light viewing, things like that as well to... Yeah, so the program is we have we use five different supplements. Like again, this is not like to to do this like trip to Asia or Europe or Australia, you need like a fairly intensive protocol. There's five different supplements that come in the kit and that we have an algorithm now, an AI algorithm that customizes a plan um, for each person. So there's five different supplements that you take at different times. Uh, and then we give you blue light blocking glasses. So we want you to filter out blue light at certain times and we'll tell you when we want you to get light exposure. And then uh, right now, the protocol, and we tell you when to eat and sleep. And there's some really counterintuitive things, like you don't want to sleep too much. Why? If you're going to Europe, and let's say it's an overnight flight, if you slept six hours, you're going to be waking up at like 3 p.m. or 5 p.m. You know, relative time in Europe, um, or too late. So we want to give you the enough sleep that gets you to be able to stay awake till that next night and not feel bad, but not too much that you can't sleep the next night. And so it's all about like this Goldilocks zone. And then we can turn off those negative effects of not sleeping much that one day. Because by the way, a lot of the first order effects of not sleeping are inflammatory. So we're already managing inflammation. So we do that too. Um, and then for our, pro our, our clients who we do totally custom programs for, then we're programming when to exercise too. Exercise can pull inflammation out of the system. It can be alerting, can make you feel better. So we're programming when to exercise, um, when to meditate, things like that. Can you talk a little bit more about stress and inflammation? So those are things that obviously when we fly, we, we get those more. But to me, those are things that have dramatic impact on our overall well-being that, as we talked about before, are really hard to quantify. Are there overall protocols that can help with that? And then are there things that we can do uh, to, to measure in ourselves that can help adjust customized protocols for ourselves? Yeah, so we've been talking about inflammation, so let's start there and then we'll go to stress. Inflammation is absolutely required for your life because all inflammation means is activation of your immune system. And But just like exercise is moving your body, there's a big difference between like banging your head against the wall and going for a run. So there's good inflammation and bad inflammation. Good inflammation is when you have an infection uh, or you know when you break your leg or sprain your ankle, the swelling and stuff is your immune system flooding in to start to clean up the damage. 
Um, and what we've learned is, by the way, like, you know, we always were told to like ice, ice something if it was swollen, like that actually doesn't help you heal faster because it's turning off some of the immune response. So, okay. So we need certain inflammation to live, but even when it's there and it's appropriate, it makes us feel worse. Why? Um, because the things that your body produces to fight, let's say an infection are damaging the tissue around. So basically in order to make your, you know, airways or nose like less hospitable to a cold virus, your immune system is damaging that tissue and causing swelling and other stuff. It's telling, you know, those signals are telling your brain to downregulate the energy system so that you save energy and, and have that to recover. So even when you have inflammation for a good reason, it's causing you to feel worse, it's causing some damage. Now, there are other times when inflammation is sort of just purely bad, right? Like if you don't have an infection, you don't have an injury that needs to recover, then the inflammation is almost purely bad. And that's where we can start to, you know, that you can damage your joints, you can you know, damage your cardiovascular system. And so we want to tamp down that like inappropriate inflammation. That's really what we mean by inflammation usually is like inappropriate activation of the immune system. So an example of that would be if I'm allergic to cats and my girlfriend has a cat and I'm just constantly around that. Exactly. So there's three types of inappropriate inflammation. One is true autoimmunity when your body accidentally or mistakenly learns that your that one of your proteins or a part of your cell is like thinks it's like a part of a bacteria or virus and it attacks yourself. Second is allergies and sensitivities where your immune system is attacking a thing that it is safe that thinks is bad, but here it's not part of your body. It's like a, a you know, Outside. piece of food or something in the air, something like that. And the third part is um, lifestyle inflammation, which is like, you know, when you're eating things, for example, when you eat a bunch of uh, fried food or sugar, sugar spikes the glucose level in your blood. At that level, it can cause oxidative damage to your blood vessel lining. And then the immune system is going to come in and activate to try to clean up that damage, but it's going to do damage along the way. Just like when, you know, somebody makes an emergency repair to a wall, it's not a perfect repair, right? Like, and so over time, those emergency repairs cause more and more damage. And then there's these like nasty feedback loops. Like if you eat really crappy food and it causes you to get fat, then fat cells produce pro-inflammatory comp grounds that drive inflammation every day. So you have this sort of chronic lifestyle inflammation. So we have three types of inflammation that are kind of inappropriate. And so then there's ways, so then the question is like, how do we manage those? Um, you know, with uh, true autoimmunity, you either are like, you have to turn down almost the entire immune system. That means either with, you know, drugs, or if you have like lifestyle stuff that's making your immune system just run hotter, you want to turn that down. And for some people that can turn autoimmune conditions off. Second thing, obviously with allergies, you want to remove whatever you're being exposed to. Um, and you can also do things to improve the body's ability to handle them, like increase the gut barrier, because then less of the food you're eating that might be causing an issue is going to get through and cause inflammation. And then with lifestyle stuff, it's about kind of preventing the damage and making your body more resilient. And then this really cool concept called hormesis. So hormesis is the concept that there are some activities, some things we do to our body that are stressors then instead of being bad, actually cause our body to respond in a way to adapt and get better. So exercise is the classic hormetic stressor. Uh, you, you know, work out, you do some damage to muscles, but they grow back stronger and it's overall good for you. Um, sauna is a hormetic stressor. That hot air is both causing our metabolic cardiovascular system to go faster. And then also just your respiratory system has to like upregulate protective mechanisms that are dealing with like this really hot air impinging on it. Um, ice cold plunge, some other things like that. So we wanna figure out how we can run these hormetic stressors to get our body to tell itself to become more resilient. And then there's cool things where like some foods act, like turn on the same hormetic stressor systems. So the compounds in fruits and vegetables that they used to call antioxidants, which is totally wrong, it's not how they work. They're actually, these polyphenolic compounds are actually turn on our body's protective systems at a genetic level. So like these beneficial compounds in fruits and vegetables are like turning these hormesis systems on, which is why they're actually good for us. As long as you're not eating something you're sensitive to, that's why they're actually good for us. Um, it has nothing to do with, um, with like antioxidants. Interestingly though, the antioxidant story plays here too because Sometimes you need inflammation beyond just the like, you know, you're sick thing. 
So for example, your muscles use inflammatory signaling and damage signaling as the mechanism that they know they need to adapt. If you take vitamin C and E, like true antioxidants, before you work out, you lose 50% of the value of a workout. So how many Americans take a multivitamin in the morning and then go work out? A lot. 50% of the value, like 50% less mitochondrial benefits. Boom. If you cold plunge right after you work out, you lose a ton of the gains too because you're turning off some of that inflammation with the cold. So one, you're blocking the signals. Two, you're turning it off. Like, do not do that. One of the a professional athlete we worked with was doing like almost everything right and the cold plunge right after the workouts. And I was like, ooh, got to change this. Um, but it's the little things like that that are not generally known that we pick up by going deep into lifestyle. I think that's so important. There's multiple things like timing that – I didn't realize how important the nuance was. So, you know, an example of that is if you eat two things together, sometimes that can have a very different impact on your physiology than just eating one or when you eat it during the day can have a very different impact on your body, which, which I think is so fascinating as it relates to this. One of the reasons why I think it's so important to bring in experts like yourself on this podcast is from what I've studied and learned, there's so much nuance in, in, performance in health and in all of these things, the vast majority of the information we get from short form, whatever it is, it breezes over the nuance and it gives a, a failed skewed perception of a lot of these things. An example would be just like you were describing with antioxidants. I've seen it uh, and I've personally fallen a victim to it in terms of like what muscle memory is completely flawed mirror neurons. I didn't realize, and I've even talked about it in past episode there's no science that supports that in humans to date. It's only we've seen that in monkeys. And like there are some similar systems, but the dir direct way that it was described in monkeys is not relevant necessarily to how we have, how pop science has curated it in, in how we learn and things like that. So to me, there's all of these little specific things, whereas we dive deeper into them, we start to realize that, oh, I could be doing like the right thing at the wrong time and then it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I was just reading, I mean, what this brings to mind is I was, was just tweeting about like, you know, there's two supplements out there that people really like for testosterone, uh, Phytogia agrestis and Tonkatali. These can, you know, there's some societies that show that they can increase your testosterone, except one of them at a dose you might get when it like in your stomach can cause DNA damage. Not like it's not a, you'll never get to that dose throughout your body. But like literally the second you eat it on an empty stomach, you could get a very high dose right with that part of your stomach and it might cause damage. And the second one has these studies mostly in rats and it like causes the composition of their testes to like change by like 50%. These are numbers that are like the way they're changing like are so large that like there's no way it's good. <laughs> And in a lot of these rats, it never comes back to normal. Like there's all, even when they stop. So there's like, you know, uh, I, we use a lot of supplements with clients. I am, I'm not one of these people who's anti-supplements, but like we are big on safety. And so like, that's one of the other reasons, like we do regular blood testing to see like, Hey, occasionally somebody takes something and it's not working for their body. Like, let's stop it. Um, and look, we don't understand everything about the body. Like even the things I'm talking about and the nuance, there's, I'm sure there's greater levels of nuance that no one has discovered yet. But if we're measuring outcomes that you care about and working based on these hypotheses, that end of one experimentation where you're the, you know, we're just seeing, does it work for you? And also like, hey, if it causes a 1% change and takes real effort, I'm probably gonna say it's not worth it. But if something has a plus 10%, plus 15% benefit to something you care about, that's great. You can decide whether to keep it or not. And hey, even if something should work for you, but it doesn't, let's get rid of it. Like I have found, you know, some people with my sort of genetics and metabolic phenotype do really well on no carb and I do not feel good. And I have some insights into why that is, but like, so I go low carb, but not no carb. I used to eat no carb. And honestly, I felt worse because I was, this was back before I really was deep in this. But now I have like, I figured out exactly that, like I work best on this like black high anthocyanin, anti-inflammatory rice, which is low immunogenic at the like, I'm using it, like a certain amount of it, like, you know, two scoops or I'll use a kitchen scale because I'm like that, you know, like I know exactly how much makes me feel best and great, I'm good to go. And so I just want, 
I want it to be easier for more people to do things that allow them to hit their goals. So this is completely tangential, but it came, it came to me when you were talking about food. What's the deal with, I think it's tart cherries. Yes. I, I've been hearing a lot about it in terms of sleep and a lot of those types of things. Is that like some superfood? Like what, what's the deal with? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of tart cherry juice, but there's some real caveats here. So there's a, there's a pretty broad amount of research showing that tart cherry juice and even some extracts in capsule form can decrease inflammation and accelerate recovery. And uh, one, I think you have to be a little careful because a lot of these studies end up in people who have really crappy diets. So adding anything good is sort of helpful. But we see even in people who eat very good diets that the right kind of tart cherry juice or extract can dramatically improve recovery. What do I mean by the right kind? It's got to be concentrated and then stored frozen because the there's I think there's only one study on this. I had to pull it from like a master's thesis to find it. The degradation curves for some of the really bioactive compounds in it are um, very quick, even at refrigerator temperatures. So even if stuff is refrigerated, it's going to degrade. So now I've got to now I had to go out and find companies that produce this stuff, and they they're that's, I wanted it made in America because the other stuff is being shipped in from Poland. I have nothing against Poland, just if it's sitting on a ship for a long time, it's going to not be frozen temperature. So I had to find somebody that makes it here, stores it at freezer temperatures, makes individual stick packs because no one like it's really thick and you don't want to pour it out of a bottle. It's kind of annoying. So to do like basically this whole deep dive into it, and we found this family farm in Michigan that does a great job. And so we work with them and they, they make great stuff. And so What's in there are these anthocyanin, these polyphenolic compounds. I mentioned that trigger your cells to um, the switches for them to like uh, build themselves more like into a more resilient state. And so there's this genetic pathway called NRF2 that is well studied and that these compounds hit that genetic pathway, activate it, and the cells are like, oh, we need to like, you know, make ourselves more resilient. So what's likely happening is you take this post-workout we try not to do it pre-workout. There's not as many antioxidants in these, but I still think it's better to do it post-workout so you don't interfere with anything. Um, some polyphenols you can take before workouts and they don't mess with it. But anyways, so take a post-workout, you're getting super fast absorbed sugar. It's just the natural sugar that's in cherries. That's gonna re replete your glycogen very quickly. And then you're gonna get this super high dose of these anthocyanins that's a super pro-recovery. And the other thing people have found is this stuff can help sleep in some people. You'll see some advertising like it contains melatonin. It's true it contains like trace amounts of natural melatonin from cherries. That's not why this is happening. Turns out that one of the compounds in there causes your brain to metabolize the amino acid tryptophan into the melatonin ser serotonin melatonin pathway more. So it basically is shunting these compounds into the pathway that produces more endogenous melatonin. It's not the actual melatonin in there that's doing it, but for some people can dramatically improve their sleep. That is so fascinating. I mean, so, I, I love it. This stuff, like also people who don't get the right amount of carbs after workouts, it depends. Like some people, they may not need that. That's not really their goals. They're trying to do more metabolic stuff and they don't want the carbs. But for high-end athletes to replete their glycogen and other things, for some people, the carbs are dramatically valuable. I think, honestly, one of the ways we closed one of our big investors is because we figured out really quickly that like he wasn't eating enough carbs. We changed his diet up like while we were doing the fundraising process. And he noticed this huge gains in the, in the gym, um, all because he told us, Hey, the weird thing I notice is I sleep better after I eat ice cream and I'm warmer. And it was, it's cause it's doing glycogen synthesis. He was on a super low carb diet. And so we basically like gave him this stuff and he was like, this is incredible. And they wrote a speak check. So that was great. Um, so yeah, I mean like a big component, but again, it's like, when do you use it? Got to, we want to store it frozen. Like it's fine if it's out for a few days when it's being shipped to you, but like we want to like really give you the maximum benefit. So we like tell all of our clients, store it in the freezer, take it out, throw it in your gym bag. You know, it's fine for that day. And then boom, mix it with water, take it down with some protein. And I will tell you, I've never, it's one of the highest impact individual supplements I've ever seen. So everyone listening, go buy a tart cherry tree. <laughs> yeah, just keep it press in your, your own. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I don't know. We, maybe we can maybe we can put a link to the stuff we use. Yeah, at the for end sure. Of this. Uh, it's not our. We don't we don't sell it. So it's uh, a company that I don't make any money for. But they're a really great. It's an American company too. Well, you know, you mentioned it before, and we we talked about it a little bit before. But you know, t uh, 
when you take this before or after you work out is something I find very interesting. You were talking about how vitamin C is uh, essentially has a negative effect on your on your individual workouts and the benefit you get from there. But there's other things. I think collagen, for example, it needs vitamin C directly to be bioavailable. Yep. And so we get these weird interactions between different things that have negative effects, but it takes a lot of nuance to understand oh, when should I take this collagen with vitamin C so that it doesn't hurt my workouts, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. And to me, that is that is where, again, the true nuance comes in to these types of equations is that, man, there's so many dependencies that it's easy to do the wrong things, which is a little bit I think bit it's concerning. really easy to do the wrong thing, which is why even super smart pro athletes we find are like, oh, like this is like a simple error. But like they're doing 90 things right. And so, you know, I don't blame anyone for like, literally I spent all of my day thinking about this and working on it. Like other people just don't have the time to do that. And I don't like, that doesn't make them not smart or not like, it's just like literally like, I don't have the time to go learn to be a car mechanic. And like, I kind of wish I knew how to fix my car better, but like, I'm trying to figure out how to fix your mitochondria. So I'm gonna like outsource my, like transmission to someone else. Yeah. Well, again, that's the whole idea of any podcast or anything like this is the whole point is we're aggregating knowledge. We're talking to experts. We're studying the history so that other people can just get the benefits rather than going through this. Yeah. I mean, and I, I love talking about this stuff. I mean, we were just at lunch before this and we were just geeking out that we could have literally recorded our lunch conversation um, and put that on. But yeah. And I think, you know, for my money, inflammation is the thing not being talked about enough. It got to be a buzzword, but I think the level of detail that makes it actionable. So that's an area I'm interested in. Um, but then stress is the other thing you mentioned that we can go deep on. I assume those are related in some way. Yeah. So your stress hormone system, stress actually at the beginning will tamp down inflammation. Why? Think about, if we think about how these systems evolved, your stress system is the same as a zebra. And a zebra's stress system was designed see or hear a signal about a lion and get away from lion. <laughs> like pretty simple. And then when it's away from the lion, calm down and recover. So what does that look like? You want to dump gl sugar, glucose, and fatty acids in the, into the blood for fuel for your muscles. You want to increase your blood pressure. You want to turn off essentially all non-essential systems. Uh, lower blood, you're going to lower, you're going to like turn your gut off. You're going to turn down blood flow to your skin, maybe in case you get like, you know, bitten or something. So basically what I just said is like stress totally dysregulates the body in this optimal way for escaping from a lion, but not in an optimal way to be turned on all the time. For the average American, not pro athlete, I just described, you know, high blood sugar, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, like, like gut problems, like classic American problems. Um, so, but what does this mean for an athlete? So what we need to understand is your stress system is absolutely required to perform at an elite level. You need your stress system responding and giving you the physiological resources for your body to, you know, run down the field and, um, be hyper acute and fo hyper focused, things like that. So you absolutely need that during a game. If your stress systems are on too low, you'll underperform for sure. But if they're on too high, you'll underperform too. There's an optimal. So the average person has a curve that's kind of like an upside down U, which is like level of performance and level of stress. So as if you're bored, you perform low. And then as you perform, get more stressed or more aroused in the psychology literature, you'll perform optimal. And then if you're too stressed, you're kind of frazzled and fried in your brain. Yeah. So more aroused. That's why a lot of the athletes were taking Viagra. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Arousal always has that double meaning. Um, but of course, Viagra does increase blood flow. It's a vasodilator, so it increases blood flow not just you know to your uh, to your junk. So, um, so okay. So we want our stress systems in the optimal level, and then when we're recovering, we want them kind of low because they turn down recovery because recovery is kind of the opposite of active performance. So, let me see if I can correctly rephrase this. So basically, as an athlete performing at a high level, you want your systems to be running normally, be able to spike up and then very quickly get back down to more base stress levels. And that's where the magic is. It's not maintaining this high level stress response, but it's effectively like using the stress response when it's like most effective when you're 
training when you're competing and then hopefully getting out of that state as quickly as possible back to a lower baseline. Exactly. And in fact, we have data from the special operations community showing that the people who make it into special ops units are the ones whose bodies can do exactly that. And the people who don't make it in either don't spike as high or when they come down, they also will come down below, like some of the systems will come down below baseline. And so like, they're not like, they're not even able to like come back to normal. Like they're, they're overstressed and overtired. And that probably means over time, they're likely to burn out more or other things. So that's absolutely right. And then I would imagine if you don't ever get back, to, uh, your baseline is just relatively high. That's someone who's pretty anxious and has negative impact of stress from the physiological effects over a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're too high overall, then you're not recovering the whole time and you're using up resources and you're just burning too, like an engine, you're burning too hot. And so what are the protocols? I would assume meditation. I would assume there's some dietary uh, nutrition elements of this. Um, you know, what can people be doing from that perspective as well? Yeah, so I'm going to kind of start from the morning and go to the night because that's one way I think about it. Um, a lot of people don't eat in the morning and their body has to turn up their stress systems a little bit to provide fuel. And so we often find that eating in the morning can be anti, uh, can be like lower their stress in the afternoon. Two, uh, not everyone that has that effect, but but it's pretty common. Two, um, if you find that this is more of like our business clients, but I'm sure for athletes too, especially with social media, if you pick up your phone first thing in the morning and it causes you stress, you're just like turning your system up for the rest of the day. So if you can like get up and get your brain, your, your prefrontal cortex, that higher thinking part of your brain isn't like fully online, right? When you wake up. So if you can like wait for 20 minutes to get everything online, maybe eat some food, um, brush your teeth before you let like stressful things into your field that can affect you for the rest of the day. Um, then next thing we're going to go on, like, um, recovery from your workout. So we do want to make sure our body gets nutrition after the workout because that's a signal your body it's safe and, and it helps your body recover faster, which can decrease the kind of consistent stress. When you like, if you work out crazy hard every day and have no recovery days, also your body's going to not be able to like kind of turn itself off. It's going to like always be ready for that stress. So, you know, making sure that people are, you know, you obviously need to work out hard, but you also can't overstress your body. Then, um, hey, if you're about to walk into a stressful event, if you have water before a stressful event, no effect on your cortisol levels, cortisol being a major stress hormone. If you have protein before a stressful event, no effect. If you have fat before a stressful event, no effect. If you have sugar before a stressful event, it can double your cortisol dump. So like what you eat combined with the event can actually be um, really interesting. Now that's going to be less likely to cause an effect for like a, a physical stressor, like exercise, cause your body's going to be able to use that glucose, but for a psychological stressor, um, definitely true. And then there's a couple things like you wouldn't want to do this late in the day because it has some stimulants naturally in it, but cocoa flavanols, these like uh, polyphenol compounds in chocolate actually seem to be able to lower stress levels. So that's a, a hat tip for dark chocolate. Um, I used to run this trick in the Pentagon. We'd get into a meeting. It's 4 p.m. The generals haven't eaten since breakfast. They're like stressed. They're snappy at their team. They're not focused. I just hand a like piece of dark chocolate out to everybody at the table. You model eating it. It's got to be individual wrap because people won't take from a bar. They get like germs or whatever. So to eat it, watch like everyone will eat it then. And like their blood sugar is a little bit better, which means their brain's a little more focused. Their stress is a little lower. And I could get a yes out of that meeting when it would have been a no otherwise. I love running that trick on them. And I just do it over and over. And they eventually explain that I've been like messing with their physiology for months. And uh, that moment is when you make the big ask. And I've been victimized by that. <laughs> I've uh, absolutely previously. done that to you. <laughs> and you've seen me do it to other people yeah. everywhere. And also just people love it. It's such like a nice yeah, thing nice, to do. Like psychologically, it's a nice gesture as well, where it's like, oh, I do something for you. You're going to... Uh, reciprocate in some way as well, which is kind of cool. Yeah, totally. And so then, okay, now we're getting to the towards the end of the day. Now it's about starting to let your body turn down naturally for sleep. So things that keep your brain hyperactivated, bright blue light, um, exciting content. So like, you know, playing video games versus reading a book. And oh, by the way, bright light plus exciting content seem to have a synergistic negative effect, which means you don't feel as tired. You don't want to go to bed. You can't fall asleep as well. So 
if you can have dimmer light and or you know like blue light blocking glasses or if you're crazy like me i actually have lights in here that actually just change color at night um and so it's just all orange around and if i'm watching tv or using my computer i'll put on glasses that block blue light this is a really nice fix and then um and then it's about going to sleep and getting high quality sleep because if you don't get high quality sleep you have elevated baseline stress hormone levels the next day so all of the professional basketball players that are up late streaming playing 2k probably not best for their overall careers i mean probably not you know like i'm not saying do i'm like do what you want to do at well, the end of the day like blocking glasses. i mean but maybe it is because it's like maybe their career is partially being a social media personality or they're playing all their games at night uh, and they sleep in like you know but yes also probably not um but I, well if any pro athlete is watching and you want a pair of blue eye blocking glasses i got you i'll hook you up so just shoot me a uh, message on twitter or wherever um but yeah it helps and you know people are surprised i love it when people are like wow i got tired really quickly i was like yeah you were that's like how you should normally be and they're like oh i used to be wired till i went to bed i i get so mad at myself because there's this threshold at night where i'm like reading, working on something and I, I'm like tired and then something clicks around like 10 30 or 11 and I get awake again. And then I'm like, Oh, I missed the window. Like I should have gone to bed. This is, this is a terrible thing that I've done. But you're probably hyper productive in that time. Yes. That's the problem. I mean, I, I know every, almost everybody, I certainly know that feeling, but yeah, your body probably want to go to sleep and then it like decided, all right, we're not going to sleep. So we're going to elevate the stress hormone and elevate the sympathetic nervous system activity to compensate. Um, and you'll probably have worse quality sleep that night. And some nights it's worth it and some nights it's not. So uh, changing gears just a little bit. You talked about B12. Yep. We talked about tart cherries. Um, obviously, cold plunge, sauna, these are very popular things right now. Are there any pretty straightforward protocol supplements that are going under the radar that could help improve performance in athletes. And we talked a little bit beforehand about caffeine and nicotine and their, their impact on reaction times and things along those lines. Can you talk about those? And also if there's anything that from protocol wise or a supplementation wise that might be valuable to athletes, obviously based on their individual physiology, but if there's any broad strokes that are available. Yeah, and I can try to give you some heuristics for like, here's the kind of person this is more often good for, even though it's not 100%. Okay, caffeine and nicotine. Caffeine uh, has very clear benefits for cognitive performance, reaction time, sharpness, and neural drive. So if you, on average, the average person takes caffeine before they work out, they will get more gains from their workouts. However, Caffeine also ramps up our sympathetic nervous system activity. That's like our fight or flight system. And that's going to make it harder to sleep if it's not out of our system. And it can also just ramp up our stress, overall stress levels. Uh, and some people, it drives anxiety too. We find a lot of people, if they can stop caffeine altogether, then they have less anxiety. So it's about like, how much is the right amount for your system? And so how can we figure that out? One, it should not be affecting your sleep. You should still be getting great sleep. Two, if you have a sleep wearable like a Whoop or Aura, um, your, it shouldn't be affecting your heart rate variability, HRV. If you find on days you don't drink caffeine or if you take a week off and your HRV is higher, that's a good sign that you're having too much caffeine or it's too late in the day. Um, and the amount of caffeine that affects people runs from, runs from like, some people are very sensitive to even one cup of coffee or 100 milligrams, and some people can handle a couple cups of coffee, no problem. So it's, very, it's a lot of individual variability. Um, but there's some real benefits to it. You just, there is a real trade-off. And so the other thing is like, Hey, if you're an NFL player where you play, you know, 16 to, you know, 19 games a year, that's a very different thing than if you're an MLB player playing 80, what is it? 160, 160 to 165. Yeah. So like, yeah, like you can't 160 times a year to mess up your sleep is very different than, than 16 or 19 times a year. So I think it really can be individually variable, but like you do want to try to not mess up your sleep as much as possible. So caffeine can be great. Um, there is some, if you do get some of the anxiety or some of the stress stuff from it, you can take the supplement L-theanine with it. It's an amino acid naturally found in tea that seems to decrease some of the cerebral blood pressure, uh, blood pressure effects and also can lower some of the anxiety effects from it. 200 to 400 milligrams taken at the same time as coffee can be beneficial. So that's something that people can do. Um, 
And a little sidebar before that, yeah. I, we were talking about stress reduction, things like that. There's a lot of hype around, I think it's ashwagandha right now. Is there viability to that as it relates to stress? I mean, what is it does it does seem to work for some people. It can lower cortisol levels and lower how stressed you feel. But there's some weird, there's some un some data I would say, like you don't want to take it more than a than month or even a few weeks, probably, because some people it can lead to like anhedonia or loss of feelings of like pleasure or emotions, like really flat affect. So you don't want to probably take that stuff forever, but it can help some people again, use that stuff more shorter term. Some people don't find an effect short term though, and they need to take it for a long time. So it's one of these weird things where it's like probably people are sensitive to it or not sensitive. If something, if you take something for a few weeks and it's not really like a long-term deficiency thing, like, and it doesn't work for you, probably just stop taking it. Oh, if I've learned anything from this conversation so far is just try stuff. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, just put it away. And then stop it and start it again to notice if you need to keep taking it or if like you feel better when you stop it. Some people like, like it was good initially and then bad later. So yeah, but the experiment, like end of one experimentation is my like, is my biggest shtick. I wrote a four part series on our blog about this. Like I'm very, very um, big proponent of this. So yeah, other supplements for stress. We use those cocoa flavanols. I mentioned L-theanine, ashwagandha. Um, trying to think of anything else that's like I like broadly applicable there. Um, you know, for some people, if you have a magnesium deficiency, your nervous system is more touchy. So mag um, Any glycinate particular can be a nice mag glycinate, glycinate can be good, good, or magnesium acetylcholate can be good. What about, I think it's magnesium citrate. It's another. Magnesium citrate can be good. Um, it has a little bit more of a gut effect, which is great in people with GI issues or a slow gut. That's really good. Um, but you can't, most people, at least early on, can't take as much of it as they might want to without getting like diarrhea. But if you have a slow gut, then taking it can be a great benefit. Fascinating. So uh, moving on to nicotine, obviously probably the opposite side of the stress reduction than L-theanine or yeah. ashwagandha. Um, nicotine is so hot right now. In the startup community, nicotine is like the hottest stimulant by far. It is very clearly an extremely effective cognitive enhancer. In fact, there's some reason to believe that it's the, in a person who's never taken it before, at the right time, it's the best of them all. But it has these nasty characteristics or which are like one, you tolerate to it really quickly, meaning like the benefit you like will lose the benefits from taking the same dose very quickly. Two, you can get addicted to it, which means your body not only doesn't get the benefits, but it needs it. Um, and three, at high doses, it does cause a very strong stress hormone dump. So like the amount of nicotine in a like traditional cigarette is enough to cause a very strong stress hormone dump. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, if you're gonna use nicotine, you wanna use it infrequently and at the minimal effective dose. So for like Zins and gums, you're talking about these like two, three milligram smaller doses for sure. These big doses, six or maybe even 12 milligram doses are like, are, are big hits to your system. So from what I understand, it's actually most, effective or healthy to take it via gum. So gum is going through your GI tract rather than uh, a pouch, which is going through your, through your skin, which enters the blood more quickly. Is it, am I right in saying that going through the GI tract is actually less addictive, but might have slower burning? Effects? Most of the gums are designed to have you kind of chew them a little and park them next to your gum and next to your gums to get absorption there too. Um, but you like, I think what you're saying is, is slower absorption probably better? And the answer is with any drug, a sharper, faster absorption is going to cause a stronger hit. And that probably, and that will then be trigger those addictive uh, pathways more. So like a cigarette is the fastest you breathe, inhale it, you get it through the lungs super fast, but one, you really don't want to be putting anything in your lungs that shouldn't be there vaping, smoking, just not a good idea because your lungs are very sensitive tissue. You're going to cause inflammation in that tissue and that inflammation is going to transduce the rest of your body. Um, so yeah, slower rise time, uh, lower dose. You know, we're, we've recently been looking at these dosages and trying to figure out what's the like dosing timing protocol. turns out the research here is like not pretty bad as it turns <laughs> out because it's all like smoke. All the research is designed to say smoking is bad. And by the way, smoking is bad. 
But like, we want to know for these new forms that don't have the cancer causing effects of, of tobacco. Um, so we think that basically you probably want to either do this like one week a quarter or you want to use it like no more than like a couple times a week, two, three times a week where you're always having a couple days off in between. And again, using that lower dose um, and not using tobacco or vaping. So, and the other thing I'll just mention that I think is underappreciated. If you get yourself to using a lot of this stuff, one of the major ways it can be, a, it can mess you up physiologically is your body will wake up earlier, your sleep less, and your body will wake up earlier and because it wants nicotine. And so that means the nicotine is messing up your sleep. And if nicotine is messing up your sleep, then obviously you have all these downstream effects. So if you find that you wake up and have a craving for nicotine in the morning early, that's a, a sign you should really cut back. That makes a ton of sense. And going back to effects, so you talked about cognitive enhancer. I would imagine for some things in sports, that's better. I mean, so caffeine, I've seen it improves reaction times, yep. for example. So, oh, if I'm hitting a baseball, that probably would help me. That do, cognitive enhancement doesn't necessarily mean improved reaction time, correct? Yeah, there's different. There's a ton of different areas. Uh, nicotine will do a bunch of these similar things to caffeine. I think. I, I think what this gets to is like, when do you need that thing? So, like, you know, batting practice or or hitting in a game, you might want hyper acute reaction times. But if you're just doing a workout, like lifting and other things, like you shouldn't be using a like that's not a great use of it because you're gonna you're not gonna get all these other benefits and then you're gonna when you do use it for the game days you're gonna have less of a jolt from it. It's so like I think of this a little like the way I personally use caffeine. My system's a little sensitive to it, so on normal days I drink no caffeine. But if I have been sleep deprived or have some other reason I need a hit, I use caffeine and let me tell you I feel like a million dollars. I feel like I'm taking a hit of a much stronger drug because I just don't ever use it. A double espresso and I'm ready to go. We could take over the world. Everything's good. So like again, use these things at when you need them. Like on day to day, I've got great energy. I don't need caffeine. When I'm tired, I'll use it and then I'll feel great and I and then I'll stop and then I'll stop using it again. So like I think we can optimize the way we use these things and like I'm not against most like there's very few things i don't think i think we should all avoid there's no morality play here i just want you to perform at your optimal and and figure out how we can use all these tools together like the only reason that steroids in baseball was wrong is because people agreed not to do it otherwise like i don't care like when people would be like oh but is it fair if we use these cognitive enhancers in the military i'm like fair I don't want fair. I never want a fair fight. I want our, I always want it to be an unfair fight. The only question is if this is a good tool to use for this application. So that begs a larger question. This might be too big for the scope of this episode. They're talking about a new Olympic Games that is essentially open in yep. terms of what people can take. What would you recommend for an athlete, say, in uh, the decathlon? I mean, so... And again, you this know, is not advice I, for I'm anyone. Not, this is use. not medical advice. I'm not a doctor. So the prescription drugs we're about to talk about are not, um, I'm not saying you should do these. I'm just saying that there is some research that suggests. Um, so basically, what, I mean, it's a question like for decathlon, there's skill, there's endurance, there's strength. So you're going to be doing things during the run up to it. Look, it's very clear that in the right person, um, steroids can be helpful. They can increase recovery capacity. They can increase muscular gains, but you have to use them the right way. Um, and at the right doses, like in there, not all studies show that taking anabolic steroids like testosterone actually gets you a lot of, you get more muscle mass, but you don't always get more muscle gains. If you don't use these things the right way, there are people in this world who know how to use these the right way. This is like the powerlifting community and others that, that are performing in, um, non-tested kind of events. So there's, there's an incredible amount of tribal knowledge on how to use this stuff. For, you know, hyperacute, hyperacuity, you know, the amphetamine class drugs can be very effective at that. Um, for recovery and endurance, it's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the world of peptides. This is an area that it's clear things work. It's not totally clear what the long-term effects of them are, but these are, you know, the, there have been studies where they asked athletes, if you could take something that guarantees you won a gold medal, but you die 
in like 10 years or whatever, would you take it? And a lot of them say yes. And so I'm not here to make a moral judgment on people about whether they should or shouldn't, but like these people want things, you know, they, they want tools to enhance their performance. So, you know, there's all kinds of things to increase endurance, recovery. And so I would just like use all the right tools. And I think what's interesting about this question of like an enhanced games is what are protocols that we might learn from and physiology we might learn from this that we can then use other tools for or that we find more normal people should be using these? Like almost, based on the research, almost every guy over 70 or 75 years old should be on testosterone. And it's been demonized for a variety of reasons and the research just does not support that. Like it's kind of a no brainer. You have to do it the right way and you have to be a little bit smart about it, but like they should be on testosterone and like, is it bad? Is that like, why, why do we care? We put people on tons of other medications. What's different about that? You know, most women should be on hormone replacement too at, at a very specific moment in, in perimenopause or, or menopause. So I think I'm totally open to it. I, I think we do need to think about a society about what it means to say it's okay for people to do things that we know that we believe are going to hurt them. So, you know, that's a big question. Um, you know, like, just as we probably don't want or shouldn't want people doing drugs on the street, like, do we want people doing drugs there um, with supervision, without supervision? And then there's a final piece of it that is a really, really cool question, which is Lance Armstrong isn't the best, doesn't win like, what, six or seven Tour de France's because he's the best athlete. He is the best athlete. He doesn't just win, so he shouldn't just win. He doesn't just win because he's doping. He wins because he's the best athlete that's doping, whose body also responds well to doping. So you might have another athlete whose body just doesn't respond as well to doping and they wouldn't have won all those things. So like this really interesting genetic and physiological interactions with the drugs that we're gonna probably learn more about if we go down these paths. And just like working with Navy SEALs taught me things because they were at the edge of what's possible for a human, it's interesting to learn from what's possible with it at the edge of what's possible as a human. Yeah. And again, I would never advocate for anyone breaking the rules or anything along those lines. I think it's more of an interesting thought exercise that what can you pull from those people who are specifically purposely augmenting their body that could help any civilian improve their performance? Yeah. I think we've learned a lot about uh, testosterone replacement therapy from sports or people who've been doing it and testing it on themselves in the gym illegally. The, the best program, the best protocols for that stuff come out of people who were using it in the gyms and they knew how to do stuff like that. The tribal knowledge is still strong there. Yeah. Well, they're doing it more effectively than people who are going to clinics in terms of the, yeah. the like dosing and the timing and things along those lines. Something that frustrates me a little bit is when athletes are injured, sometimes they're prohibited from taking things that could genuinely help them improve that regular people already have access to. So you have this hyper elite athlete that blows out their knee and they they don't have access to the same effective approaches to care as I might just being a normal person. They have other benefits in their care in terms of best doctors and things along those lines. But to me, that's like a really weird middle ground gray area associated with that. Yeah, I think during injury, it should be an absolute exception if prescribed by a doctor and like you could decide what those things are allowed are. But like yeah, absolutely. I know, you know, when I know people who get injured and they're using all kinds of things that would not be allowed by uh, pro sports, but like almost certainly are accelerating recovery. And like, you know, these are people who put their bodies on the line. I want them to accelerate recovery. So in you know, before we, I, I want to do a, a deep dive in, into a bit more about Fount and, and the story there. But before that, I'm also interested, what is like the gray area of performance right now? Maybe between legal and illegal Obviously, peptides are related to that, but you know, if if people are pushing the limits in sport and performance, it could be you know from a drug perspective, a genetics perspective, uh, a training or approach perspective. What what does that landscape look like? Yeah, um, look, you cannot be the best in the world at at anything, sports included, without having elite genetics. And so there is an increasing push to be able to sequence and predict who might be able to be a great athlete and at what sport. And so this is happening with kids now. The really gray area is 
there are some companies that are trying to figure out how to allow you to like, let's say you do like IVF or you have like eggs frozen. Can you pick the ones with the best genetics? So that stuff is, there's companies trying to push that technology forward. That's, you know, what are they going to choose for? Is it going to be intelligence? Is it going to be athletic skill? Are parents going to choose for height? Other things like, you know, if there's a menu, it's very interesting to know what the, what the things people select for. That tells you about a lot about what a society values. So I think that, I think, I don't know that peptides are a gray area. I guess they're just like, they're, there's just not as much research on the long-term effects. There are people who know to use them effectively short-term. Um, I think in terms of other drugs people using, there are like, there's not just testosterone, right? There's like 20 different testosterone derivatives. There's these SARMs, which are synthetic androgen receptor modulators. There's like a whole world of these drugs that are in the anabolic class. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are some of the different things that, that, that are talked about that people are interested in. Um, and you know, I'm also just interested in, you know, the other thing, you know, I work with a lot of execs, business executives, the other things going on there are psychedelics. People are using these psychedelic drugs like psilocybin, mushrooms, and other things to change their psychology, decrease stress, to do a variety of things that can help them perform better and, and for some people be happier also. And so I think those, in as much as they're illegal, is also a gray area, but it's pretty common in the like high end business world. I literally just read an article in Golf Digest about one of the professional golfers microdosing and their experience and their their sensory experience differing on the golf course, which I think is pretty interesting. Super interesting. And like again, this might be a kind of thing where they might change uh, how quickly you learn things, uh, including like you know motor learning. But then like you might want, but the at a high dose they're gonna like cause discoordination and other things. So like, again, like what's the protocol for you? If you're going to use a thing, what's the protocol you would use it that would optimize them for where they're good and then not using them on game day or what, you know, whatever things like that so that you have optimal coordination. Then are you shifting in like a nicotine or a caffeine? Like how do you use all these things together? That's the real magic is the like what, when, how, why. I, when doing the homework for the motor learning episode, I learned that right after you get injured, there's essentially a month window where you have inc increased neuroplasticity for that limb and improving the the movement patterns and those types of things. To me, that was really interesting in terms of can we fabri fabricate increased neuroplasticity around movement patterns or learning or things along those lines that probably psychedelics might be able to, to tap into in some way as well. Maybe. Um, also things like TBI, brain injuries, like football especially, but soccer also where you get some of that chronic um, traumatic stuff um, might be interesting for that as well. So yeah, I think, you know, again, like I always say I'm tool agnostic and outcome religious. I just care that it works and as and I can consider safety part of it working. Um, sort of safety is sort of the long term version of it working. Um, but like, I don't care if it's like I need to eat the like ground up grasshopper, or I don't care if I need to eat the you know you know root extract of this plant. Like, I just want it to work. And if it doesn't work or it's not safe, like I'm just not interested. Um, and then from there, we can talk about risk reward. We can talk about cost benefit. And all those are real discussions, but the first question is like, does it work? Yes. Well, it seems like you found something that works very well on the jet lag side. Could you tell me a little bit more about how people can learn more about Fount? Uh, anything that's coming up in the pipeline? I'll, I'll obviously, if it's okay with you, I'll leave a link in the description and the show notes to all the stuff you're doing. So basically, you know, we love doing this hyper personalized stuff and we run that with elite coaches, most of my coaches are former special operators or military personnel who've spent a lot of time downrange and we do your blood work and we'll take your wearable data and we'll do these deep dive interviews to get this, you know, subjective and also like lifestyle data. And then we run N of one experiments with you every week and it's super fun. We found some people just need the plan. They can run it themselves. So we do lighter touch programs too. But not everybody can afford, frankly, like a full one on one program. And not everyone can, like, kind of is that place for that. So what we've tried to do is say, okay, what are our most effective protocols that we can get to people who just aren't in a place for this? So we have now a class of products that we've launched 
that are the protocols that we found that work for more than 80% of people. So Flykit's our jet lag product, running like 93% of people can go anywhere in the world with minimal to no jet lag. That's awesome. Um, the next products in that line are for immunity, fertility, PMS is a huge um, negative on women's performance and hangovers. We have like a really sophisticated way to mitigate the effects of alcohol on your body because alcohol is like ramping up your sympathetic nervous system and causing inflammation and messing with your sleep. So we do one pack before you start drinking, one pack before you go to bed, one pack the next morning and kind of manage all these systems. And it seems to work really well. So, so we've got a line of products for those indications that, um, that really work well for almost everybody. And we're so confident in them. If they don't work for you, we just give you a refund. Like that's the world I want to live in, which is like, this works. And if it doesn't work for you, okay, there's no risk. And then we've taken from our clientele, we have these, you know, thousands of N of one experiments. We've taken the protocols that were most effective for energy, focus, mood, sleep, these kind of everyday things. Um, and we now sell those supplement protocols. Um, and then you can customize from there. And I'm really excited that we're just about to launch um, based on all these N of one experiments, we've designed a, an AI driven um, kind of, model that can basically turns into a quiz. You can upload, you'll be able to upload your blood work, answer 34 questions, and we can give you a very sophisticated supplement protocol. And then we can modify from there. Amazing. Andrew, I learned so much during this conversation. Always a pleasure catching up with you. Thank you so much again. for Awesome, man. Out. Always great to see you. Thanks again.